Hello in Europe. Do, do you know that girl? Grace Hopper, the inventor of programming. One of the things she used to say is uh, that humans are allergic to change. They love to say, we've always done it like this. I try to fight that. Let's see how relevant this is today for us and how we can find, uh, fight, fight that. So yeah, welcome to... Uh, my name is Tomek Wisniewski. Welcome to... So yeah, the title of the talk changed in the meantime. Uh, how micro apps help us stay flexible. Um, I, well, I actually used to work at an amazing company called Listable, but we've changed the name. We are now called Kalo. So yeah, as you can see, as, as, and as you could probably know, uh, in the tech world, things change constantly. Uh, this is one of the reasons so many people highlighted uh, how easy it is to refactor Elm programs once they are in production, if you remember Brian Hicks' uh, talk yesterday. So uh, there's actually this resistance to change. So as, uh, just as many other things that Grace Hopper said, this uh, allergy to change thing is, is uh, still holds. Uh, and it actually has a name, resistance to change. What's up? Come on. Okay. Any idea what that name is? What that? It's a single world, word. Whoops. A little hint up there. Yeah. So uh, JavaScript fatigue. It's like booming on Twitter for the last couple of years. Uh, and basically, I th my opinion is that fatigue is what, uh, so the same kind of energy which makes people complain about what is, about JavaScript, about the government, about whatever, is kind of, the, it's the same energy which holds them from changing the surroundings. So this is, uh, yeah, this is resistant to change, and we, as, as the forefront of, of front-end uh, development, as Elm lovers, know it very well how, how, how great it feels to, to not be afraid of change. And, uh, and stay flexible. But, uh, yeah, so, so uh, we probably, yeah, one of the things uh, which might help us realize how, how vital it is to, to, to stay flexible, uh, to adapt to change, is the story of Amazon. Um, yeah, I assume you guys know what Amazon is, but it, it wasn't always like this. So Amazon used to be a, a little bookstore, a little online, online bookstore. And almost no one in this room uh, had heard about it by, by that time. So uh, from the very beginning, they weren't afraid of change. So they kind of started out with a small system, which allowed people to buy books. Uh, the system grew. They expanded. They added new features. At some point, they started selling other things like movies and uh, electronics. So they, yeah, they, they grew this big complex system which, which, which needed to handle uh, loads of cases. And as you can imagine, uh, this, at some point, uh, the system grew so big that no single kind of person could understand the, uh, all of it. So. Uh, you basically kept adding features rather than changing features because changing the whole system was super expensive. You needed lots of expertise from the people that contributed to that system from the very beginning of, of the code base. Uh, so in 2001, just as a little highlight, this is what Amazon looked like at that time. You, you, can, you can see that they, they already have like electronics, music, camera, photo, health and beauty, so lots, lots and lots of stuff. Uh, but at that time, it was still a single system which handled all of, the, all of that shopping experience, all of that international shopping experience. Uh, so, yeah, they decided to do something about it, to, to, to change the, uh, the situation uh, so, that, so that they can adapt to, uh, to, to what's happening in the market. So what they did was uh, they, they basically... Uh, 
sublimed a, a platform out of, out, of that, out of that system, a platform that was capable of supporting not one uh, service, which handles everything, whoops, uh, but multiple services. So, yeah, they, they started breaking out bits of logic, uh, like uh, the shopping cart, the, uh, the payments module, uh, the, account, uh, the account information stuff. And what they ended up with was a... Uh, what's up with my clicker? Okay. Uh, what, they, what they ended up with was, uh, was a collection of small programs which did only one thing, like managing account information. Uh, each of those systems was, was, uh, was being developed by a small team of uh, just a couple of engineers. And everyone working on a system like this, on a small system like this, understood the whole thing. So it's, this is the fits in my head test that Richard talked about. So each of those services could fit in the head of the developers who, uh, who, were, uh, who were responsible for it. So yeah, you might be like, Cool story, bro. Yeah, I can I can kind of impress my friends at, at the pub, but that's not what I what I want you to feel about this story. What I want you to feel is, let's do it. So um, that's what what we felt at Kalo as well. Uh, so I, in addition to this story, I'll now tell tell you the story of uh, of Kalo, a kind of modern day story, which is very relevant for uh, for. for Basically, each of us working in a, in, a, in a team, I guess, in a growing startup. And then I have a collection of, of, of smaller stories because I, I, I kind of hope that this, these, these things that we've found out recently about, about adapting to change, about staying flexible, that these things are kind of relevant for everyone in the room. Uh, so, let's start with the, with the story of Kalo. So, yeah, there we were kind of chatting about stuff, uh, about our code base uh, at Kalo London. And uh, at some point, we were, we were uh, chatting about performance. Uh, we, we, uh, at, at that point, we had like 20, 100,000 codes of React in production, uh, 20, 100,000 lines of code of React in production. Um, and we were kind of struggling with, with, with performance because the, the app took a whole, uh, well, quite, quite, a, quite a while to load and, uh, and to react to, uh, to user input. Like, imagine clicking a button and then waiting two seconds until the app recalculates and re-renders. So yeah, this was just dreadful. And uh, at that point, we kind of started doing things about it anyway, but at that point, someone brought up this tweet uh, about WebAssembly. Uh, for those of you who don't know WebAssembly, it kind of allows compiled, uh, compiled languages like Elm uh, to run almost, almost on the uh, bare metal, uh, like uh, compile front-end applications so they can run at native speed. And this is some, uh, yeah, so this was one of the, one of the arguments, uh, the thing that Sebastian uh, brought up yesterday. Uh, about having this kind of single, single problem that the, the technology we're currently using does not solve, but Elm solves in a very neat way. The other thing was that Elm is kind of technically, uh, every Elm application is technically uh, uh, capable of running on multiple cores automatically. So this, there's like lots and lots of performance benefits of switching to Elm. Uh, so, yeah, we, we decided to kind of uh, find a way to introduce Elm uh, to, to, the, uh, to the massive React code base that we, 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 we had at that point. Um, so yeah, this is our code base. It's all React components, nicely abstracted and self-contained, just like React components, object-oriented and stuff. Um, so... The backend team at the, same, at the same time was struggling with very similar problems. So on the, kind of, on the, on the company level, we decided to split the development team into smaller, uh, smaller crews that, that kind of have a chunk of code 
a chunk of the application that they own. So the back -end team, uh, for the backend team, this was a very easy decision to move to microservices because this is a road that uh, has been explored pretty well in the past. But we were kind of looking for a similar solution for the, for the front end. Uh, we could find some examples of people trying this uh, and, and uh, document, uh, having documented this, but this was mostly like server-ended stuff, so, so we kind of needed to explore uh, the area. And it, it turned out that... Uh, yeah, I, I'm just wondering what order our slides are in. Yeah, so, so, so we decided to... Uh, to do the same thing as Amazon, kind of explore the same, the same process as, Amazon, as what Amazon did, and, try if, and see if it kind of maps to the problems that we have on the front end. So what we did was uh, abstract away a platform for uh, managing data and kind of communicating between those components. This is the thing that's there on the bottom. We abstracted away a platform for, we started abstracting away a platform for uh, rendering things, so everything is consistent across the board. And, yeah, so we ended up with a nice sandwich like this. And we started... Uh, so, so what, we wanted to do, what we want to do at this, at, this, uh, at this point, what we wanted to do is start splitting this... Uh, yeah, start splitting this stuff into like, self-contained applications which have... Uh, which could run... Uh, separately, which can be deployed separately, which can be developed separately without the overhead of the whole application. Uh, and in addition to that, each of those applications can, uh, can, yeah, that's going to be the next slide. Uh, so let's zoom in on, uh, on, on this. So some of those applications are just our old React code, uh, code wrapped in, a, in an API that all uh, kind of wrapped in a form that all other micro apps understand. But uh, we only, actually from the outside, we only care about the outside wrapper. We don't care about, about what happens inside those apps. Um, so, whoops. No, 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 that's not what I wanted. What's up with this clicker? Okay. Uh, some, of, some of those apps might, might be neatly uh, very neat Elm applications wrapped in, in a wrapper like this. Some of those might be just plain old vanilla J JavaScript spaghetti code. Um, so yeah, let's, we started with, a, with an experiment outside of the code base. So, so yeah, now is, the, now, now, now is the moment that everyone has been waiting for. Uh, the live demo. Uh, and the, and the live demo is about, uh, about uh, I kind of, we kind of made a presentation timer so I can give this talk. Uh, and it's, it, it has a special feature which you'll see in a moment, uh, which, I, which, I, which I needed for this. Uh, so, so here it is. Um, the, the idea is that it, it changes color to tell you where, you where you are in your talk and where you kind of should be. Uh, so, so, yeah, we can start with green and then add color breakpoints at, sec at second two, we change to pink, and at the fourth second, we change to blue, let's say. Of course, this is, uh, like, in reality, this is not two seconds, four seconds, but rather uh, the minutes that required for those for those individual sections, and there we go. Yeah, so we, we see it's it's doing what we what we told it to do, but the uh, the interesting thing is that it's uh, it's not a single application. It's a single experience composed of multiple micro apps, so little applications, which uh, kind of fit inside the, the the head of a of a single little development team, and they can also kind of pick the technology that's most relevant, most comfortable for the team, uh, and makes most sense to maintain in the long run. Um, so let's look, let's look under the hood. Uh, this example, so for, 
uh, we built this ex example with with web web components because they they're like super super nice to illustrate those uh, those uh, principles. But uh, this kind of app shell and mi micro apps inside the, they can be uh, so the, the technology is isn't that relevant. You can you can achieve the same with uh, with an Elm wrapper with a with a React wrapper. Uh, but what's what's really important is that. Uh, so in this case, we have, a, we, have a, we have an app shell that's just plain old HTML. This is just static HTML delivered right to the, uh, to the, uh, to the browser from the server. And uh, we can see uh, two web components. One of them is timer controls. This one is written in Elm because of, because of those like, a bit more complex interactions inside. And timer display, the thing that we see uh, when we start the timer, so right now it's paused. Uh, this is this is a, a, a React application. Um, let me just pause it again. Uh, so as you can see, uh, these these micro apps take data that kind of streams into them, and this is this is pretty much like like uh, the URL of your application, which which kind of streams into the app and uh, forces the the initial state. Uh, and the rule is so we, we, we found we, we found that a couple of things are helpful in, in kind of shaping this uh, this structure, and and one of them is just follow the unidirectional data flow that things can flow into the into the, the micro apps just like the URL, but uh, if you want to communicate with the outside world, you send messages. So this is basically this works exactly the same as microservices on the back end, which. Which uh, get some initial startup stuff and then send messages to each other to uh, to communicate. Um, and as you can see, we can try we can try, for example, changing uh, changing the the color breakpoint that's streamed in here. So there we go, N nice magenta. So the uh, just as changing the URL changes the the app inside. Uh, the changing the data that streams in also uh, yeah kind of streams into the component, but but uh, we don't care about the internals. Yeah, we only care about the URL and the messages coming out. Um, now let's yeah messages in this case are just uh, DOM uh, DOM custom DOM events, but you can also use uh, callbacks or uh, Elm. Uh, messages for this. Um, we can we can cast a brief look uh, of how it how, what it looks like uh, code wise. But let me just find my editor. No, this is this is these are my slides. Yeah, so. Code-wise, this is this is very uh, very simple stuff. Let's see if if I can find it. No, I think I've I don't have it open. But uh, I think the the more interesting thing is because this is basically just ports uh, for sending those messages, outgoing ports for sending those messages, incoming ports for receiving changes in the in the data. But uh, what's what's interesting, I guess, is the ability to uh, to mount a. So we're, we're right now in the Timer controls application, the one written in Elm, and what we can do is uh, mount it independently of of the rest of the application. So, so this is basically what the what the what the team responsible for uh, the the color the timer controls application uh, sees here. Yeah, so 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 they can just concentrate on what's uh, what's important for them, and don't need to care about the rest of the application. Um, all right, so let me get back to the uh, the slides. So I try to I try to end each of those stories with something that you can you can tweet. Uh, this is please don't tweet this because this is uh, this comes well. This is catchy, but this uh, isn't isn't so. Uh, what's up with my clicker? Yeah, so so this, uh, 
This is catchy, but this isn't, this isn't super accurate. So it's not microservices, because this is a specifically backend term. It's, it's, uh, uh, this is why I called it micro apps. And it's not only web components that can, can take care of this stuff. So basically, this sums up the thing pretty, pretty well. Micro apps are, are self-contained apps connected into a single experience. Um, yeah, uh, so there are, th there's a whole bunch of other stories that I, that, I, uh, that I can tell you, but I think we need to, we need to push this back till question time, uh, perhaps as, as an answer to uh, some of the questions. Uh, so just, just to sum things up, uh, why I think micro apps are really uh, great, awesome, amazing, for, uh, for structuring the code base in a larger team. So it's great for users because uh, you can imagine being able to ship your little bit of, uh, of an application independently of the whole other stuff uh, leads to a super tight feedback loop. So uh, yeah, the, uh, so if something's wrong, we can fix things really, really quickly or ship new features for a demo really quickly. Uh, Engineers are happy as well, because, because Elm, uh, because they can basically use any technology that's most suitable for the task uh, and any technology they feel most comfortable with in the long run. Um, the business side is happy as well, because just as, just as Amazon... Oh, there's one more thing really important that I forgot in the, in the, in the Amazon story. So this, this uh, system of services nowadays uh, it's called AWS, so a subset of, the, of that, and it generates 70% of Amazon's income. So they started out as a bookstore. Nowadays, they, they earn money as a, as a cloud computing service and also deliver food, sell lots of other, other things. So this is flexibility, and flexibility means being able to adapt to the market. So yeah, business, business loves that, this uh, being able to adapt. And of course, the CTO is very happy because they, they can sleep sound. And as, uh, yeah, once again, Sebastian, uh, they, they, they are so relaxed that they can watch Netflix while coding Elm. Um, yeah, one, uh, one, more, one more thing to mention. We're kind of on the way towards a, a, a micro app system and uh, we're still exploring this area, so if you have any thoughts, please stay in touch. Uh, this, this is our tech blog, klohq.tech. This is my Twitter handle. Uh, these are the examples that I showed during the, during the talk. And while we take some questions, I will post the slides to Twitter so we can all see it under Elm Europe 2017. Um, thank you very much. My question is, how do you integrate uh, inside uh, two parts of the Elm app? So let's say you have your header and your footer in Elm, and you want to have the content in React. How do you do that? Yeah, so uh, I th I, I'm not sure I understand the question, because uh, so I, I, I hope uh, this this slide, uh, this slide right here, uh, kind of encapsulates all this. Uh, so, so this might be your header written in Elm. This might be your footer written in Elm, and this might be your content written in React. Yeah, and uh, they communicate between each other using messages. And there's one more, one more thing to keep the state. Uh, of, of the application in sync. Uh, the, the secret is to treat data, all data, as real time. And this is what this platform is for. Kind of keep making sure that every micro app uh, kind of gets real time data. Just like, just like an app communicating with a w server through WebSockets. So you would have an app for the header and a different one for the footer? 
Yes, yes. Okay. But uh, to answer a f question which would probably follow, you don't need to deliver Elm twice. You can deliver Elm once and, uh, and kind of start two apps on the same runtime. Do your micro apps come with their own backend, or it's only on the UI? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, what we what we are doing is uh, only on the UI level. Then you have the the data layer, which is which is common across all applications, and this is this is responsible for getting data and uh, caching it uh, from the server. So the server is also chunked up into microservices, but. Uh, the division is different. It's, it's based not on uh, views in the app, but rather on specific domains, just like what Amazon did, yeah, for kind of user management, for uh, management of projects. Um, but you, you, I, I, I've heard of companies doing uh, kind of, or at least ideas of, of, of stitching those two together, yeah, have a single microservice, which has a backend component and a frontend component shipped to the, to the browser. Yeah, just one more thing. We are, we are hiring, by the way. We're an amazing company. And please join us because it's, it's really great. Thank you.